Welcome to another installment of Donning the Armor. This morning we will begin in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. Now Samuel said to all Israel, Indeed, I have heeded your voice in all that you said to me, and have made a king over you. So if we recall the people of, even though Samuel had been so good as a judge, so good as a leader following the death of Eli, so good in leading them in the spiritual way of things and and judging over them, as he aged, his sons have begun, begun to become corrupt as Eli's sons began to become. And the people don't want them as their judge. Seemingly thinking that the judgeship would follow as a kingship, would follow a line of a family, instead of being people selected directly by the Lord. So in that case, they don't want his sons judging. They say, we need a king. We need a king like all the other nations. We need a king to rule over us and lead us in battle and lead us to prosperity. Samuel, disheartened, goes to God, and God tells him, look, they're rejecting me, not you. But if that's what they truly want, they they want out from under my kingly hand of protection, I'll give them a king. I'll give them a, a, a human king. I had already talked about this in Deuteronomy. I had already predicted this hundreds of years before, that the people's hearts would become so hardened to me that they would at one day wish to have a king rule over them. So he allows him, he leads Samuel to Saul, or more likely leads Saul to Samuel with the donkeys. And then Nahash comes against Gibeah, and Saul rides to their to their salvation and their victory. And Samuel brings all the people to Gilgal, where Joshua had his camp when they first came into the promised land. And now Samuel is addressing the whole congregation of Israel. Representatives from all over. For those who can't make it, they'll be the messengers. That he has listened. They wanted a king. They wanted an earthly king. And now they're going to get it. And now here is the king walking before you. And I am old and gray-headed. And look, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my childhood to this day. So from the day he was born, the day he was weaned, he was put in to honor God at the, at the tabernacle. He has walked before them. He has walked in their presence as a godly, as a godly example of how they're to go. But now he's old, he's gray-headed, his very sons are with the congregation now listening to this very same address. Here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I received any bribe with which to blind my eyes? I will restore it to you. So, as we know, Samuel seems to have taken this decision to ask for a king very personally. He's taken it as an indictment on himself and his leadership. And now he's saying, I want you to stand as a witness against me before the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, in the presence of the congregation, in the presence of his anointed, his king, who he just chose. I want you to stand as witness against me and tell me who I have wronged that would would have you wishing to have this king, to want to come out from under my leadership. Tell me who I've cheated, who I've stolen from, who, who, who has been able to bribe me to, to, to pervert justice for them. Show me where I have not been the leader I was supposed to be for you. And they said, you have not cheated us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. And they admit it, you have done nothing wrong. But of course, that was never their problem. Their problem wasn't with him. 
Their problem was their short-sightedness in looking at who was actually in charge. They saw Samuel and said, you're the one over us. You're the one in charge. You're the one judging us. You're the one leading us. And when you die, your sons are going to be over us as judges. And we don't want them because they're not you. So in a way, Samuel's asking something that the people never fully accused him of. But I think they're talking past each other in a way in that he's seeing it as a condemnation of his leadership because his leadership was installed by God. They're looking at the leadership to come next because they're not thinking of God at all. And that's part of Samuel's issue is that although the people have re-entrusted themselves to the Lord, they're still not fully trusting the Lord. They still look at everything in a materialistic way, the same as they did through the time of the judges, where they would constantly play the harlot with, with the idols, with these other Baals and Asherahs, where they would leave the true worship of God to start letting something else into their life because the, the minutia and detail of life starts to take us over. They have God as a king. They have the greatest king they could ever have. And instead of viewing it that way, they're simply viewing what other people have on the, the horizontal level of life, our day-to-day -day life with each other. When Samuel sees things as a vertical, where are you with God? And where that intersects is where Samuel sees himself as taking care of people and being right with God, he sees himself as that intersection. And he feels the entire congregation of, of Israel should see it that way. And although they should, just as we should, in our own day and time as a nation of priests unto Christ that are to go out and speak of his gospel and spread his gospel and be his image bearers, we, like them at this time, are looking only at the horizontal. Looking at our harvest, our wealth, our provision. But not looking at where the provision comes from or why it is the abundant level it is. Or the not abundant level it is. Why do we have little or why do we have a lot? Either way, it comes from the Lord. You know, I, I see here so many Christians talk about, well, it, it, it's a demonic attack. It's the devil's keeping us from. Po yeah, I mean, yeah, true. But they don't have power over God. So even if that's happening, it's with the, it's by the authority of the Lord. Not that he is directly commanding it to happen, but that he's allowing it to happen for his glory to strengthen and temper you. Paul speaks about a thorn in his flesh. And a lot of people will talk about his eyesight or his knobby knees and his baldness. He was apparently a very unassuming person because he did have poor eyesight. We know that from the epistles when he speaks about, look at how big the letters are that I have written you. Meaning, and we know he used a scribe most of the time probably because his eyesight was getting poor. Paul was not a young man by the end of his life. He was a much older man. So we know he probably had poor eyesight, but the, the thorn in his flesh, he does speak of it being a demonic messenger. Now, was the demonic messenger bringing forth a physical ailment? We don't know. But the, the, the demonic messenger himself is the thorn in the flesh. And he says, I prayed to the Lord three times, which is a Hebrew idiom for, I've prayed consistently to the Lord to remove this thorn from my flesh, to remove this demonic messenger from me. And although some Christians will go, well, he, God never said no, because it doesn't say like directly the words God said no. It does say that God refused because in the weakness, it glorifies the Lord. That, that demonic messenger being a thorn in the side of Paul 
allowed God to be glorified that much more through his work. And that's the level we're on. That level of looking at, oh, well, the devil did it. Demonic warfare did it. Yeah, in lot in, in some cases, yes. Not in all cases, because then you that then you forget just how evil human beings can be on our own without actually having to worry about that. But that's not all. It's not like a demonic influence shoves past God and God suddenly isn't our shield in that in that moment. It's still what is being allowed by God. And the Israelites can't see that. They're not, they're, they're looking solely here and very rarely here. Even with Samuel as their leader, they're looking very rarely here. So they're saying, you're right. You you never cheated us. You never oppressed us. You've never taken anything from any man's hand. But that's, that's not, that's not, that wasn't their issue with Samuel's leadership. It, their issue is that they ne- they couldn't see the Lord's leadership and trust in him to raise up another leader like Samuel to bring them into the next stage of their nation. They were too involved with this and they wanted a man to be king just like everyone else on this level had, rejecting this level. We don't want to get to that point where we're rejecting this level for this one. We need to reject this one for this one. Then he said to them, the Lord is witness against you and his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they answered, he is witness. So he's just making them witness against themselves that it was not my leadership. And he's doing this to set up something, to try to get them to understand that the problem isn't with him. The problem is with God. And he's going to lay out this understanding for them that, okay, you've now witnessed before the Lord that I have not been against you. So you're not turning away from me. He wants them to understand that. And the people understand that already. They understand that, no, it's not you, it's it's your sons. We don't want them to be our leaders. But he wants, to tr- see, wants them to see who they are truly, truly rejecting. They understand it's not him. He understands it's not him. But he wants them to truly understand what is going on and what they are in actuality rejecting by wishing to have a human king. Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron and whom brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. It was the Lord. It wasn't Moses and Aaron. It wasn't your fathers. Now, therefore, stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and your fathers. When Jacob had gone into Egypt and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, the commander of the army of Hazor, into the hand of the Philistines and into the hands of the king of Moab. And they fought against them each of the time of judges. Every time they forgot God, he would sell them into the hand of the people, into these other armies, into these oppressive forces. Everything that's come against you is not because you didn't have a human king. It's because you forgot to honor your king that you do have, the Lord your God. The creator God who brought you out of out of bondage in Egypt. The creator God who put you on this earth and named you as his chosen people. Every time you forgot that, he brought in someone. He allowed someone to come in. And oppress you every single time. Then they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Asherahs. 
but now deliver us from the hand of our enemies and we will serve you. And the Lord sent Jerubbabel, Bedan, Jephthah, and Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you dwelt in safety. Badan is Barak with uh, Deborah. Just a different name for him. Just like Jerubbabel is a different name for Gideon. And he adds himself in that because he is a judge over the people and helped lead them against the Philistines. That every time you turned back, he rose up a judge to deliver you and lead you for the rest of their life. Every time. And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. And that's what he wanted him witnessing against. Prove to me what I did wrong that you're now turning against God's messenger, God's anointed judge for a human king. Oh, well, you've done no wrong because they're looking at the sun. They're looking to the horizontal. And Samuel's reminding them of that vertical. That every time you turned, you would cry out and the Lord would raise up a judge. Raise up a mighty hand to sweep out the oppressors from before you and give you peace in the land again. Every time it happened, every time, now you cry out that you need a king. Now Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, is coming up. And no, you want a king to reign over us now. You want a human king. Because you never realized that the Lord your God was your king. The Lord was your king the whole time. And every time you came into struggle, he raised up a general. A judge. Gideon. Barak. Jephthah, Samuel, Samson. You raised up these people to help you. That's what the Lord did for you. So understand when you're rejecting me now, you have rejected him as your king because you're not trusting him to raise up the next Samuel, the next Gideon, the next Barak, the next Jephthah. In your short-sighted look at the horizontal, you're not trusting the vertical to bring forth a next in line. And that's a heartbreaking place to be, a heartbreaking realization that th this is where you see them fall off. This understanding that they're missing the point. And so often I feel we end up in that same place where we miss the point because we get caught up in the minutiae of the horizontal and start to not trust the authority and sovereign will of the vertical. What he can provide and what he can do and what, how he can protect and lead us. We say it, we know it, but every once in a while, the minutia of the horizontal blinds us to the true trust we should have in the vertical. Now, therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. And take note, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve him, obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. This is your king. This is whom you wished. This is, Sam, uh, this is Saul. This is the man you desire to have over you. You have turned from the kingship of God for the kingship of a man. Now God has already laid out the judgment of this. He's already explained, had Samuel explained to the leaders of their tribes what a king is going to do, what a king is going to take from them, what a king is going to demand of them. He's already explained all of this. He's explained that he's going to take your sons. He's going to take your daughters. He's going to take these things from you. He is going to tax you. 
he is going to become your oppressor in many ways. So that's the judgment. But then verse 14 is the mercy. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. That continue following the Lord means it will continue to be led by the Lord. As they followed him through the wilderness as a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud, uh, smoke and cloud. That's what they're saying. Just if you obey the voice of the Lord, even though you're turning away from me in this, I will still have mercy. I will still have the grace to love you and lead you if you truly humble yourself under my commandments and follow me. Theirs was a covenantal relationship where you had to perform certain tasks. Your works very much, much meant something in the covenant of the law. Not what we're under now, but what they were under then. So if they didn't rebel against the commandments of the Lord and did the works they were to do, kept the feasts, kept the Sabbaths, kept the sacrifices, kept the obedience to what God called them to do, then he would continue to lead them. Beautiful mercy from the Old Testament God, who is the New Testament God. God is the same today, tomorrow, yesterday, unchanging throughout all times. God's nature is perfection, perfectly just, perfectly loving, and perfectly sovereign. God is perfection at a level we cannot understand. That is his nature. And because he is perfect, he never changes. Never needs to change because everything he does is perfect. And because that his perfect love never changes. Meaning his net perfect, ever enduring, long sufferingness doesn't change. His mercy just doesn't change and his grace doesn't change. So he's reminding them, my grace and mercy are still there for you if you follow me. And if you are obedient and don't rebel, then you will still be able to follow me because I am still perfectly just to follow through and loyal to follow through with the promises I have made to your fathers. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. The kingship doesn't change. You now have a human king. You want that? I'll give it to you. You want to eat 10 pounds of gummy bears? All right. I'll let you suffer the consequences because you don't want to listen to me. Just be prepared to sit over your toilet for a while. You want a human king? You can have it. Be prepared for the tribulation that is to come. But obey me. Be obedient. Do not rebel against my word. And I will still have my loving grace and mercy upon you. However, if you do not obey my voice, then the kingship hasn't changed anything. You will still be judged just as you are under the judges. You wanted a king instead of a judge? That's fine. But understand, you're not humbling yourself and submitting yourself to the authority of that earthly king. You're submitting yourself to the authority of me. Because that king needs to submit to my authority too. Because I am the Lord. Nothing in the situation has changed just because you now have a mantelpiece. Just because you have a person that you can look to in perpetuity instead of generationally. That's fine. But the reality of the situation doesn't change. 
I am the Lord. I am the king over you. I am the king of kings. You will be obedient to me or I will remove my hand of protection from you. I will allow you the wickedness in your hearts. I will let my hand back and allow that to take you over and give you exactly what you want. Nothing has changed as it was with your father, so it will be with you. Obedience to my commands and honoring me is what comes most. Now, people and unbelievers will say, well, see, this is an abusive, vicious God. How could you do that? That's not real love. That's coercion. That's you got to understand. Unbelievers will also say, well, if God's so good, why doesn't he get rid of evil? And then when God gets rid of evil, how come your murderous evil God got rid of evil? You can't have it both ways. But Israel is under a specific covenant of true obedience and humility under a sovereign God because they are a specially chosen people, his chosen people, not chosen unto a special salvation, chosen as a special tool to perform a very special task, to bring forth the reconciliation of all creation through them. A task not given to anyone else. I love Jacob, but hated Esau. That hated is the same kind of hated you use when Jesus says, if you're to love me and follow me, you must hate your mother and father. Jesus kept the law perfectly, honors mother and father. That's not the hate. It means to love me less than them. My kids should love me less than God. I am to come to a far second beneath Christ. It's the same way here. Christ, God, is to be above all. Jacob wasn't loved and hated as if you, you put one hand out to bring in one child and shove the other kid away. It's that Jacob was loved to be chosen as this people. Esau was not. Jacob was elevated above as this special tool to perform this special task. So yes, he had to be harsher, especially with these people, than he had to be with anyone else. Because the tool needs to be shaped and molded for its task or it's not worthy to be a tool. You need a Phillips head screwdriver, not a flathead. It needs to be designed and molded a specific way to do a specific job. And that is what his chosen people are, a specific tool for a very specific job. And because of that, his love was great for them, but his discipline was harsh for them because he needed them molded to do a very specific thing. Now, therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord it will do before your eyes is today not the wheat harvest. So at this point, it is the dry season. Is it not the wheat harvest? It's the dry season, not the rainy season. The Israel, the Middle East is much different than the United States. We live in what these ancient people would probably call a Garden of Eden style place. We have such abundance and lushness of greenery. We get just enough rain most of the time, unless you're out to the, the U.S. is a gigantic country, out towards the West Coast in the desert, Israeli type areas. But for the most of the country is lush, gorgeous land abundant, prosperous land. So here in the wheat harvest, in the, in the dry period, the Lord is now going to do something before their eyes to show 
to prove through sign and wonder this covenant and this moment in time for his people. Is today not the wheat harvest? I will call to the Lord and he will send thunder and rain that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking a king for yourselves. So it's not just the words of Samuel. So that they understand what they're doing and that they have turned away from the Lord, that this new instance in time through sign and wonder is going to be established as now the beginning of the era of kings. So Samuel called to the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die for we have added to all our sins the evil of asking a king for ourselves. Because they truly did not understand what they were doing. They did not fully understand that asking for a king was denying God's authority over them, denying his, his true authority over them as their king. But now they see it. They see the sign and wonder of the Lord and understand that by this sign, they now understand the wickedness they've done and understand that they've now entered into a place where they're not going to now be able to turn back from it. You didn't want the judges. Now you get the kings. And now you've come to a point where there is no turning back. Then Samuel said to the people, do not fear. You have done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Look, you've done wrong. You've done wickedness. You are in sin, but do not fear. Don't let that fear of your sin turn you from God, but serve the Lord all all the more because of the sin you did. You recognize your sin. You, you've done the confession, the homilageo. God says you have done wickedness by asking for a king. And they say, Lord, we have done wickedness by asking for a king. They have said the same thing. Now they need the repentance turn aside from the sinfulness because the king's going to stay. But in this case, you've done the wickedness. Don't turn your back to the Lord. Serve him all the more because of the wickedness you did. Serve him all the more so that that way you know the purity and greatness of your God. And do not turn aside for then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. For the Lord will not forsake his people, for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Don't turn away from the Lord. Don't let the guilt in your heart turn you from God and chase after empty things of the world the vanity of the world, which will profit and deliver nothing of any real value, because the real value is in eternity, not in the material. For those things are for nothing, because the Lord is not going to forsake you if you turn to him and follow him. For his great name's sake, because it pleased the Lord to make you his people. They were his inheritance. Their inheritance was the land. The people were the Lord's inheritance. His mighty chosen people, his tool to bring reconciliation back to himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. 
For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Don't fear fear the Lord. Don't turn away in guilt. He loves you. And he wants you to follow him. As for me, I will continue to pray for you. Because that is my calling. I'm not going to turn against the Lord and sin before him because of bitterness in my heart. I'm going to continue to pray for you, to pray that you find your way back to him and that you never turn from him again. And I will do my duty in teaching you the good and right way for the rest of my life. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. I'm not one to do life verses, but that that would be a good one. For Samuel 12, 24, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart for consider what great things he has done for you. But he ends it after telling them all the love. Out of love, he gives them that final warning. But if you do wick- wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. You want a king because you want to be like all the other nations because you see that king as a symbol of strength. But that symbol of strength means nothing before the Lord. The Lord is sovereign. The Lord's will be done. So if you do wickedly, if you turn from him, there is no earthly king that will save you because salvation comes from only the Lord, from only him through only his grace and his mercy. Those great things he's done. So serve him with all your heart. Fear and hold him up in all. Humble yourself before him. Such an amazing message given by Samuel in this moment to follow the Lord. Follow him in all his ways. Follow him with all your heart because he has done great, great things for you. And here we stand under the covenant of grace. And if you think the great things he's done for the Israelites were great, the sacrifice on the cross was even greater. So because of that, we should hold him in all above all else. And serve him in truth with all our heart. Trusting our salvation to him and him alone. Not to do wickedly. Not to let our guilt get the best of us. But never to turn from him. Because it pleased him to send his son to the cross. Because it pleased him to lay down his own life. Because it pleased him to reconcile us to him by the righteous blood of Christ. That is the greatest thing he could ever do for us. So undeserved and unfortunately so underappreciated by this world of ours. Don't be one of the people who underappreciate it. Serve that truth of the death and resurrection and saving righteousness and grace of Christ with all your heart and spread that gospel to all you come across. All right, so that's where we shall end it for today. I hope this was fruitful for you. I hope to see you back again next time. But until then, be blessed. 